So I have a bunch of girls that live in my house, and so a movie that came out a couple years ago has been a, a favorite, watched it a lot of times. It's called Encanto. I think there's a picture of it up here. Encanto, anybody know this? It's really a pretty fun, pretty fun movie. Yeah, great movie. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno in our house at all. Yeah. We don't? Oh, we do talk about Bruno. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, Bruno it works out in the end. Uh, so, yeah, this a great movie, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, while the girls like it, I actually think it's the boys that like it the most. So, um, But, yeah, this is just a, a really, really fun movie. came out a couple of years ago uh, about a family. A, a, an armed conflict forces a young couple, Pedra and Alma Madrigal, to flee their home in Colombia with their infant triplets, Julieta, Peppa, and Bruno. Pe- Pedro is killed, but the candle Alma carries gains a magical power that repels the attackers and creates a casita, a sentient house located in a magical realm bordered by mountains. Fifty years later, the village thrives under the candle's protection, which grants gifts to each of the Madrigal uh, descendants when they turn five, which they use to serve the villagers. And so this story of this enchanted house and these kind of supernatural people that dwell in the house I think it's a beautiful picture and a good parallel to what Peter says about his people, about the church. That the church is being built together as a spiritual house filled with priests who are there to serve, who are gifted and equipped supernatural people living in an enchanted house for the good of the world. And so that is what we're going to talk about today in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. This remarkable parallel of what God intends for his church, his people to be in the world. We're going to see two things today. I'll go ahead and give you our outline here so you can follow along. Just two points. The first is this, is that the, te- the church is a temple of worship in the world. The title of our message is The Church in the World or God's People in the World. And in 4 through 8, we'll see that the church is a temple of worship to the, in the world. And in verses 9 and 10, we're going to see that the church is a chosen witness to the world. So if you want to know what Peter thinks about what the purpose of the church is, what the purpose of God's people is, it's to be a temple of worship in the world, and a chosen witness to the world. So would you look with me at 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10. It says this, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, the church is God's temple of worship in the world. That's what we see in verses 4 through 8. We see here that as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So here Peter tells us that Jesus is the cornerstone. And a cornerstone, he's using temple language from the Old Testament. He's using building language. Uh, That the cornerstone was carefully chosen by the architects, by the builders. And it had to be just right, it had to be just perfect, because if you set that first stone exactly right, then your building will be level, it will be strong, and all other stones will then fit together appropriately. You can see a picture of a cornerstone on the bottom left. you got to get that first stone right, because it defines the building. And he calls Jesus the cornerstone, who has been rejected by men. It is not the stone, it is, he is not the one that people naturally want to build their lives on, but he is the one whom God has chosen and is precious to God. God has chosen Jesus, even though men have rejected Jesus, particularly the Israelites, who he'll talk about here in a second as the builders. And he tells us that this stone is living, that Jesus is not dead. He's alive. You're not coming to a dead Messiah. You're not coming to an idea of Jesus in the past, but you're coming to a Jesus that is still alive. You're coming to a living stone. You're coming to a truth that still lives, that you can have a relationship with. 
He is resurrected. He is ascended, and he is coming again. He is a living stone. And these cornerstones, you pick just the perfect stone. It has to be perfectly cut, perfectly laid in place to set the lines and angles for all other aspects of the building. It is the cornerstone that defines the shape and stability of what is being built. And the bigger your building, the more complex your building, the more diverse your building, the more critical that first stone being laid exactly right and being exactly of the same quality and character that is needed is essential. And here's what's fascinating. He says that it, when you come to this cornerstone, this thing that God is building, this building, this temple of people built on his son, he says that when you come to this stone and you come to him in faith, you yourself become a living stone. You go from being dead to being alive. So this is a stone that is alive, and this stone that when you're built into him, you become alive. You become a living stone. You become like him. The living stone makes other living stone, other, this living stone makes other stones live. This God-man makes others spiritually alive. And what happens is that we get our nature from him. That when we come to Jesus and we're being built together in him, we become like him. He is a living stone, and when we build our lives on him, when we build our church on him, his life comes through us, and he makes us alive. And just as God counts Christ as chosen and precious, so also he counts all of his living stones as precious. You are chosen and precious if you trust in Jesus. The reason for this is because God has a building project. God is constructing something. The God who made the universe, the galaxies that put all of the laws of the universe into place, the God who designed the eyeball and the heart valves and the brain is designing something even better, which is a spiritual house. He is building over time a temple that is far greater than the Old Testament temple. As grand and glorious as that is, as, as grand and glorious as all of God's creation and construction is, this is the thing that has his heart, the spiritual house that he is building the one thing that he gave his one and only son for, which was to build a spiritual house, a place of worship. And he's building it not out of stones, but out of people. God is constructing a place of worship, of living stones, and you get a place in that temple. I think he's speaking not just of the global universal church, that's true, but he's speaking to a particular people in Pontius and Bithynia. I think he's saying, you, where you're at, when you're gathering with people, you become a house of worship. You are his, that when you come to Jesus, you become alive. And when you gather with other believers, you become a place of worship, a temple to God. So First Baptist Church of Pontus, you are being built together as a spiritual house of God. You, First Baptist Church of Cappadocia, because obviously they would all be Baptists, I'm sure. Or Bithynia, you, where you are are being built together, yes, in this global church, but even where you are, you're being built together. And just as these stones you can kind of see on our wall, we've got a living illustration here. Each one of those blocks plays a role. Each one of them has been carefully placed and bounded together. And while they're individual blocks, they also make a whole, right? You are being built together into a spiritual house right where you are with the other fellow stones, as weird as they might be, into a house. God is building a supernatural house of worship to himself. So really, we could pause right here and just say there's a couple applications for us right here already in just these first few verses. The first is, is that you are called to come to the living stone, to come to Jesus. You will not be spiritually alive unless you come to Jesus. Come to him. That's the call. In verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious. So if you come to Jesus and find him to be precious and chosen, Receive him. Put your faith and trust in him. Turn from your own building project and join God's building project by giving your life to Christ, by repenting of your sin and putting your trust in Jesus. And then let God build you into a local church that is made up of other living stones, real Christians, who are also building their lives and being built together on the living stone of Jesus alone. I think that's what he's calling us to right here. A stone cannot by itself be a temple. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that individuals, our individual bodies are a temple, but Peter seems to be taking this imagery in a different direction, that we can't just be a temple all by ourselves. He's taking this imagery a different direction in that these living stones must be built together. A pile of stones doesn't make a temple, right? We could just pile up some cinder blocks and we would not have this building. 
But someone carefully constructed this building in such a way that it would be a house, a place that's useful, a place that would be of protection, had to be carefully laid. And so Christians ought to be carefully laid in a local church, put and bounded together if they're going to be as useful to God as they ought to be. Karen Job says this, she says, These living stones are not lying about in idle isolation or disorder. They are not heaped in a pile or scattered across a field. Christians are not individually temples of God. They are each put in place in a spiritual house for the purpose of joining a holy priesthood that offers acceptable sacrifices to God. And so we're called to honor God by being self-consciously placed and bonded, which I think is what church membership is all about, into a spiritual house, a local church built on Jesus and clearly glued and attached together in such a way that it makes a discernible building, a discernible people by which they can worship the Lord. Go to verse 5. It tells us that not only are we living stones, but inside this house, he changes the metaphor, we're not only the temple itself, a living temple, but we're also the priests inside of it. Like in in, in Kanto, it's like there's this relationship with the people that are inside the house and the house itself. There's like this relationship between the two. Likewise, we also are the living stones, we're the temple that God's building, but we're also the priests that work and offer sacrifices within the temple. We're not just living stones, but a holy priesthood, and that's every Christian. That's not just me as the pastor. It's not me that's just offering spiritual sacrifices right now. It's you. You, right now, when the church is gathered, you're offering some kind of spiritual sacrifice. Whether it's pleasing to God or not, I don't know. That bases on the, consi- on the intentions of your heart. But you are the holy priesthood. We are all here gathered together not to see something from the front, but to participate in spiritual worship, all of us, all of us priests, all of us assigned a responsibility if we're a Christian. David Schrock puts it this way in describing the Old Testament priests, because this is what Peter's pulling on, is the Old Testament priesthood, where these priests would work long, hard days to help God's people meet God and come to him. In some, the Old Testament priests played the significant role of standing guard in God's house. They make sacrifices for God's people, and they're instructing the people so that they could enjoy God's blessings. When priests did their job, God blessed the people. But when they failed, God's curses fell on the people. I'm not the priest. You're the priests. Are we offering right sacrifices to God in how we live our lives, especially when we're gathered together? Are we here to serve? Are we here to offer up sacrifices? Priests represent men to God, and they represent God to men. And so our place in the world is to be a worshiping community, a, a holy priesthood, that is a place where the world can meet God and where God is brought to the world. This is not something in the Old Testament that you could apply for. You couldn't apply to be a priest. You had to be born of the right line. You had to be essentially assigned by God this priesthood. And the same is true for us. We are born by the will of God into a holy priesthood. He has made you priests. Every single one of, every single Christian is a priest. It's just a matter of whether a good one or a bad one, an acceptable one or an unacceptable one. It just comes with being a Christian. The church's members, i.e. the living stones, get the sweet privilege of offering spiritual sacrifices as holy priests to God through Jesus. We get this beautiful privilege, this responsibility, and this, this elevated place of being able to be the ones that stand between men and God that offer sacrifices and pray for the lost and share the gospel with the lost and gather together and offer up our ingratitude, the things that God deserves to have. What are these sacrifices? You could just look at your order of service in your bulletin. Here's some ways that we offer spiritual sacrifice to God. We we in this church follow follow what theologians often call the regulative principle, is that God actually tells us how to worship him in his word. He tells us how we ought to when we gather together to do the things that would be acceptable to him. God has told us in his word what acceptable worship looks like, and we don't need other stuff. We only need to do those things, and those things are to read the Bible, to pray the Bible, to sing the Bible, to preach the Bible, to obey the Bible, always through Jesus. We don't worship in ways that are unacceptable, that are acceptable to us, but to him. We're not ultimately the target audience of the worship service. God is. Hebrews 13, 15 tells us what this spiritual sacrifice looks like. These spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God from his holy priests when they gather. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. 
And then he defines what that is. What does the spiritual sacrifice look like? It's the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. We did that. We sang four songs already. And hopefully you sang them from the heart. And you verbalized. That you didn't just stand and stare at the screen, but you verbalized from a heart that has been changed by God and go, God deserves the worship of his people to declare praise, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Not only that, verse 16, do not neglect to do good. Have you done good for someone this morning? Some of you gave a ride to somebody to church. That's a good thing. Some of you showed up early to help prepare the place, to make coffee. Some of you handed out bulletins in order that God's people would be well-equipped to worship him. Do not neglect to do good and to share with what, share what you have. Giving. The opportunity to put some offering in that box back there is a spiritual worship that God deserves. To use my gifts and abilities, share what you have. If I have something, I share it. For such sacrifices are what? They're pleasing to God. This is what a holy priesthood does. This is what is acceptable to God. We are priests if we follow Jesus. It's just whether we're faithful ones or unfaithful ones. Do, your, do you give your words, your time, your attention, your gifts, and your money in spiritual worship to God? Is it a spiritual sacrifice to Him? Church is not first and foremost about meeting your needs. It's about glorifying God in the ways that He commands. That is what meets our deepest needs, actually, is to get our eyes off ourselves, to have a worship service that maybe isn't exactly the way we would prefer it, but is designed to glorify God. And actually, that's what's best for all of us, to glorify God in the ways that he asks us to. That actually is what is best for our needs. So two questions then rise from just this verse 5. How do you speak about church worship when we dismiss? You get in the car, you drive off, and I know this happens. What would you think of church today, right? What comes out of your mouth? Do you speak in terms of personal preference? Or do you speak in terms of God's glory? Do you ever walk out of here and go, that was a worship service that really honored God? Everything they did there squared with what God said his people ought to do. Do you think of it that way? Or is it like, I really don't care for that song? Or if it was this or that? Is it preference driven or is it honor of God driven? Because I must say, with all due respect, who cares what you thought of church or got out of it? Did God accept the spiritual sacrifices of his priesthood from his living temple today? Was God honored today? That is really all that matters to him and really all that matters to us. Second question is this. Have you actively embraced your God-given responsibility to be a holy priest in God's church? Are you an active, joyful, holy servant of worship? A priest is a servant a servant of the worship and honor of God. So this Sunday, and on any average random Sunday, are you active, joyful, holy in your priesthood responsibilities as we gather? Would you say that if you were to give yourself a grade, that you would be offering right sacrifices to him? Do you sing? Do you pray? Do you give? Do you serve? Do you listen? Do you obey? Do you love? Do you linger? Do you initiate? Do you share with others? What kind of priesthood, what kind of worship is God getting from his priests in this living house? What happens on the stage is important, but it's not ultimate. It's actually the hearts of the people here and what we do when we dismiss that I think speaks more to what kind of church we are. You are priests. Are you worshiping acceptably? The real Sunday ho drive home question is, did I honor my living stone status in God's spiritual house today? Did I offer acceptable spiritual sacrifices as a holy priest today? That's a better question. Did I worship the Lord today in the ways that he prescribes? Peter roots all of this imagery about the temple and Jesus being the cornerstone in three Old Testament passages. In verses 6 through 8, here's what it says. He says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's from Isaiah 28, 16. And then he makes this comment, verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe. So you get the honor of having received the cornerstone and all of the honor that Jesus deserves, you get to share in that because you're built together in him. But then the natural question is, what about those who do not believe? 
He's, he then quotes from Psalm 118, 22. He says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he quotes from Isaiah 8, 14 by saying, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Some people will come to Jesus and they will believe what Jesus, what God says about him, that he's chosen and he's precious. And I want to build my life on Jesus. And some will come to Jesus and they will find him offensive. And they will reject him. And God overrules them, right? We even see that in the Old Testament when he's talking about the builders, he's often talking about Israel, God's own people. The leaders of the Jewish people rejected Jesus. But that didn't mean that all of a sudden that they vetoed God. God's like, well, I will lay this stone anyway. He overruled them. This is the cornerstone, whether you receive him or not. And so you can receive him, you can be built on this stone and receive honor, or you can trip over him and face judgment. He says this really fascinating thing at the end of verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do, which speaks all kinds of things. I'll get to that in just a moment. But there's eternal honor for those who believe, and there's eternal stumbling for those who don't. There's really just two ways to live. In fact, I've got little uh, tracks down out on the cha- ta- table there that there's two ways to live. I come to this king, this cornerstone, and I build on him. I respond in him rightly, or I reject him. There's really only two destinies, eternal honor for those who believe, eternal stumbling for those who don't. The builders did not want this stone, but God overruled them and placed this stone anyway. Jesus is the one and only defining foundation stone for God's people. God's people are defined by what they do with Jesus. God's people are those who rightly respond to Jesus, and those who do not rightly respond to to Jesus are not God's people. Peter actually said this back in Acts chapter 4. This is, a, this is a theme that Peter says regularly. Back in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, they just got done healing a man, and all of a sudden the Jewish people are upset that he healed the wrong guy at the wrong time. And Peter then goes, well, wait a minute. We're, we're healing in the name of Jesus here, and this is what they say, he says in Acts 4, 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And this is... And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one way to be the people of God, and that is to respond rightly to Jesus. In a sense, what he's saying through this and through the rest of our passages is that the promises to Israel have now come to his church through Jesus. And what's fascinating, in verse 6, he talks about a cornerstone, and then in verse 7, uses a different word for cornerstone, which could also mean capstone. So the cornerstone is the very first stone that's laid that defines the whole building. The capstone is the very last archway stone that sort of completes the building. It's the one you most see. So it's from cornerstone to capstone. Jesus is beginning and end. He is the first and the last. All other living stones are built between the glory of Jesus when he died and rose again to the time that he returns and and culminates and completes this building project of God. From cornerstone to capstone, from first to last, from the beginning to the end, from the start to the finish, from foundation stone to completion stone, Jesus is king. And Jesus is the center of it all. He is the defining, from beginning to end, mark of God's people. One commentator says this, Christ is laid across the path of humanity and its course into the future. In the encounter with him, each person is changed, one for salvation and the other to destruction. One cannot simply step step over this stone, Jesus, to go on about your daily routine and pass by him to build a future. Whoever encounters him is inescapably changed through the encounter with Jesus. Either one sees and becomes a living stone or one stumbles as a blind person over Christ and comes to ruin, falling short of one's creator and redeemer and thereby of one's destiny. So if you're here and you're not a Christian today, I'm really glad that you're here, but you're really at a crossroads here because Jesus is being laid before you and you'll either build upon him, stop what you're doing and build on him through repentance and faith or you'll trip over him. Christ is laid in your path. Your eternal destiny is in front of you. Will you come to him and build your life or will you trip over him? There's two options, honor or damnation. That's it. And verse eight tells us they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Peter said something very similar in his opening uh, sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. He says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God predestined that his son would die on the cross. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawful men, lawless men. 
So your free choices and also God's will both work together. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Christians are compatibilists. God's sovereign decree is entirely compatible with man's free, responsible decisions. It's entirely compatible. The Bible teaches that. That these two things, God's sovereignty and predestination, is entirely compatible with man's free, responsible decisions. The Bible uniformly teaches that that's true. Exactly how? That's wildly complex and befuddles theologians and always will. Exactly how that happens. But that it happens is entirely the case. And that's, I think, the point of verse 8, is that while some stumble over this word, they did not thwart God's plan. You cannot un-God God, and you cannot de-Jesus Jesus Jesus by not believing in him. I've met some people that way. I don't like like this God of the Bible, so I'll just not believe in him. As if that changes him, or makes him disappear, or all of a sudden changes your eternal destiny. It doesn't do any of that. They stumble because they disobey the word just as they are destined to do. God will be vindicated as God through salvation and judgment. His holiness will be vindicated either way. You just get to decide, I guess, to some extent. You get which side of that equation do you want to be on? Honor or stumbling? Ultimately, it tells us we cannot thwart God's purposes by disbelieving in him. God will have his glory. He will have his reward. He will have his people. Bottom line, do you want to serve God's purposes on his terms and honor and stumbling? Honor or stumbling? Do you want to participate in God's destined plan by receiving mercy or by receiving judgment? Those are your options. There's two ways to live. And you can talk to me more afterwards if you have questions or if some of this doesn't sit well with you, I want to help you. So that brings us to that, the end of that first point. The church, and I would say even Redeeming Grace Church, is meant to be a temple of worship in the world. That's who we are when we come to Jesus and build upon him. Secondly, verses 9 and 10, the church is a chosen witness to the world. So we're a spiritual place of worship in the world, but not of the world, and we're a chosen witness to the world. Peter roots his encouragement in verses 9 and 10 for the destiny of believers in three Old Testament passages about Israel. Exodus 19, 3 through 6. I think maybe we have them up here. I'll go ahead and just read them. I don't have them in my notes, so I'll read them off the screen. So uh, we'll go ahead and read these together. We'll read these three passages. They're fairly short. These Old Testament passages, like Exodus 19, has to do with the Old Testament covenant at Sinai and what God says about his people that he just brought out of Egypt. And so here's what he says. While Moses went up to, to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and, th- and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you, excuse me, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So that's who God's people were meant to be coming out of Egypt, is that if you will be faithful to my covenant, I will use you in such a way to display my glory to the nations. People will know that if they want to find the creator God, come find these people because they know him. You have been set apart and carefully privileged to bear my name in the world, to be my chosen witness in the world. Then in Isaiah 43, verses 19 through 21, so this is way hundreds of years later, he says this through the prophet Isaiah. To people who actually are coming out of exile. Isaiah 43, 19 through 21, Behold, I am doing a new thing. So they had not been faithful to God. They had been punished and exiled. And now as they're coming back, Isaiah says, Hey, save this part of my letter so that when they come back, they have this encouragement. He says, Below, I'm doing a new thing. It now springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. Verse 21, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might, what? Declare my praise, to be my witnesses in the world, right? I'm going to do something special for you as a people. I'm actually going to do a new special thing that's going to be even greater than what I did before. And then we have the book of Hosea. Hosea 2.3, he quotes from this in this next couple of verses. And Hosea... God is trying to get the attention of his people who are being unfaithful to him. And he calls a prophet by the name of Hosea to go and marry an unfaithful prostitute and to have children with her. And he's going to use this as a living metaphor of this is what it's like 
in my relationship to my people. I am so faithful, I am so kind, and my people are so unfaithful. And he has two children by this woman. And God calls him to name the first one a girl, no mercy. And the second one, not my people, a boy. And there to be sort of this living parable of what God feels like with his unfaithful people who are going after other gods, who won't keep covenant with him. It's like a man with an unfaithful wife. And so even these children are named in such a way to just express God's frustration and his sadness over really this broken covenant marriage with his people. He says, verse, chapter 2, verse 23, I will have mercy. Then he makes this promise towards the end, is that even though you've been faithful, and though you're being punished for this, and though our relationship in some ways is broken, I will bring you back. He says this in Hosea 2, 23, I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. So he says, though I'm pushing you away in discipline for a moment, I will bring you back in far greater ways. So now, with those three passages in mind here, let's read uh, chapter 2, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God, for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were a, not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. You see how much Old Testament imagery he's pulling in here? He's saying, now you're God's people, Jew and Gentile together because of Jesus. You've been built together with him. You didn't reject him. You didn't stumble over him. So that makes you God's people. You are now the chosen race, the, whole, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, a people for my own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, and now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A chosen race, genos eklektum in Greek, a chosen, elected, predestined people, a race. What this tells us is that each race of the human race is going to be redeemed, and each race of the people of God is going to be superseded. That whatever race you identify with, it will be redeemed. You are most faithfully your race when you follow Jesus. And your race is not to be your fundamental identity, but your relationship to Jesus. As a royal priesthood. So it's like a superior humanity, he says, a chosen race. A, a superior humanity that makes up different races of all kinds of people. Each race redeemed, each race superseded in a new humanity. He also speaks of us as being a royal priesthood. Royal, meaning the king's possession and possessing the king's authority. Royal. So this is, we get Jesus's, we are Jesus's possession. We're his specially appointed priests, and we get to speak on his behalf. We get his authority. So this priesthood has royal possession, royal authority. And yet this is a priesthood in that it serves. Priests serve. Remember, a priest is one who connects man with God and God with man. And so Christians are authorized by the king to go in his name and serve the world to bring them into his kingdom. Not only that, a holy nation. Holy just means set apart for God's special use. Morally purified in character and disposition so that they might rightly represent him. In the Bible, especially in the New, I guess in the New Testament in particular, it's not talking about a geopolitical entity. It's talking about ethnicities. It's talking about language groups. It's talking about people. We tend to read nations into our New Testament and think geopolitical. We think America. We think Canada. We think Iraq. That's not how the Bible speaks of nation in the New Testament, but as geopolitical, but as ethnicities, people groups. God's re and then we're also God's reconstituted people. Israel had become a no mercy and a not my people, rampant, sustained, unrebellion. But then we read in Hosea chapter 3. In fact, I'm going to read this. I don't know if it's on the slide or not. But coming right after that, here's what, listen to what he says to them. Hosea chapter 3. Oh, where is Hosea? There we go. I marked it. It's a very short little chapter, but listen to this. After disciplining them and giving this living parable, he then promises them, but at some point I am going to give you mercy and I'm going to reconstitute my people. The Lord says to him, the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins, that's the worst. 
So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a letheth of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or priest, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in the fear of the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. God is going into the brothel to bring back his unfaithful bride. I'll pay whatever it takes to get her back. And she will be a holy nation and she will be a reconstituted people, a people, a people of my own. That's what he says, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Your purpose in the world now as an individual is to worship and proclaim. That's your job. That's your purpose for existing. Our purpose in the world as a church is to worship him, to be a temple of worship to him, and to proclaim him, to proclaim his excellencies to the world. We proclaim what has happened to us. We used to be in darkness. We used to not be a people. We used to not have mercy. But now, because of what Jesus has done for us, we now have stepped into marvelous light. We now are God's people, and we now have received mercy. We just tell people that. Why are you different? Why do you not speak in the same ways that other people th- speak? Why do you not go hang out in the same places that the world hangs out? Because I once was in darkness. I once was not one of God's people. I once was facing God's wrath. And Jesus came and he saved me. And so now I walk in the light. I can't do what I used to do in the dark. I'm now God's people. I, can't, I have a different father now. And I want to honor my father. And I've received mercy instead of judgment. That's why we share testimonies in our family meetings, why we share testimonies in our, for people becoming members. It's because we want to hear the stories of how people came out of darkness into light. That's the purpose of being a Christian, is to worship him and be a witness to his excellencies. John Piper says it so well. He says, you are to be who you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a reconstituted people so that God may see, so that people may see God for who he is. You are to be who you are in Christ so that people will see who God is. He has given you an identity so that his identity may be made known. That is the meaning of your life. That is the meaning of your life. That's why you're getting the degree you're getting. That's why you have the job that you have. That's why you have the family that you have. That's why you live where you live is to be part of a worshiping community and a proclaiming community. That is the meaning of your life as a Christian. So let me close with this. Here's the application. Come to Jesus as your precious cornerstone. We cannot be a living house. We cannot be a holy priesthood. We cannot be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a constituted people unless we individually come to Jesus to turn from our sins and put our trust in the one who came who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again to bring us into new life, who is ruling and reigning and interceding for us and will return again. Will we bow the knee and follow him? Will he be our precious cornerstone? I would encourage all of us to joyfully build our lives on Jesus as the defining shape and stability of our whole life, materially, relationally, financially. Not just praying a prayer or or taking on a label, but making Jesus the defining cornerstone of everything, our budgets, our calendars, our relationships, everything. He becomes the defining cornerstone that we build everything upon. And then commit to making Redeeming Grace Church or some other church a temple of worship in the world and a chosen witness in the world. We can't be a temple and a witness individually only. God calls us to be part of a people. He calls us to be a temple and us to be living stones placed exactly where he wants us and for us to be a team of priests, not just individual priests doing their own thing, but a team of coordinated priests. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a reconstituted people means that we're gathered together. We're not just individuals, but we're also a unit put together. Would encourage each one of us to enter on Sunday as a holy priest determined to demonstrate that Jesus is chosen and precious. Do that, commit to that every Sunday morning. Our life together is structured and sustained on Jesus. We want to demonstrate that every Sunday. 
In just a few minutes, our membership will be considering a 2025 budget and thinking about it and other ministry decisions. Pray that it would be built on Jesus, that every dollar we spend, every moment of ministry energy is spent worshiping Jesus and proclaiming his name. All of it. Pray that it would be built on Jesus. Pray that it would enable us to more fully proclaim the excellencies of God in our neighborhood and to the nations. And then as a living stone, spiritually active in Jesus, be built firmly by God in a church. Take your assigned place in the wall so that you might be a strong house of refuge for the hurting, protection for the vulnerable, fortress of truth, a platform for God's glorious praise. Remember, just a Just a bunch of gathered stones in a pile doesn't do any good. But when they're organized and they're put together and they're bonded together, then there's something useful and productive. And may we ever always be a holy priesthood that offers spiritual sacrifices to God. May we be who God wants us to be so that the world can see who he truly is. And may we proclaim his excellencies in all that we do. Let's bow and let's pray. Oh God, we've looked in 1 Peter at how glorious your salvation is to elect exiles, the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you that in, for the blessing of being born again to a living hope, to receive the prophecies that were promised by the prophets, to receive your word, to have the opportunity to love one another. God, we just thank you for all that we have seen so far and that you have a purpose for all of it not just to save us individually, but to collect us, to organize us, to make us a team, a temple, a priesthood, that we might represent you in the world, that we might worship you in the world. God, what a high privilege. I pray that we would not, co- we would not respond cheaply, that we would not respond casually, but that we would respond from the heart and give our lives to being part of your mission for us in the world, to be a worshiping temple in the world, to be a chosen witness to the world. God, help us to do that. Help us to know what our individual responsibility is in that. In Jesus' name.